Well, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Arpana Janaga and Emmanuel Fair? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, I'm only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Arpana Janaga was born in India. She was the eldest of two daughters. From an early age, it was clear that she had a gift for technology. She went to college in India, then moved to the United States to attend a college in New Jersey. So already in this narrative, we see it shaping up to be a horror story. In December 2007, Arpana graduated with a master's degree in electrical and computer engineering. Arpana accepted a position as a software engineer in Redmond, Washington in March 2008. Redmond is a suburb of Seattle. She rented a third floor unit in the Valley View Apartments. Arpana maintained a busy life. In addition to work, she had an interest in riding motorcycles, although she had never ridden one before. She purchased a motorcycle with the intention of learning how to ride. She joined a motorcycle club to assist with this goal. Arpana also studied martial arts and volunteered at a fire station and would ride along with firefighters. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On Friday, October 31, 2008, 24-year-old Arpana and three of her neighbors hosted a Halloween party at the apartment complex. They opened the front doors of their apartments to facilitate the party, which started at about 8 p.m. About 40 to 50 people attended most of them were friends, family, and neighbors. The partygoers, who were mostly in their 20s and 30s, moved in and out of the four apartments and consumed alcohol, which had been set up on tables outside. Arpana was dressed as Little Red Riding Hood and consumed red wine. She appeared to be having a good time at the party. A black man named Emmanuel Fair was one of the people in attendance. Emmanuel had a criminal history, in 2004, he had been charged in connection with an assault of a sexual nature against a 14-year-old victim. He entered an Alford plea, which meant that he acknowledged the state had enough to convict him, but maintained his innocence. He ended up spending almost three years in prison and was still on probation at the time of the Halloween party. Emmanuel normally lived with a childhood friend, but his friend was out of town for the weekend. Emmanuel contacted a friend of his named Leslie Potts, and she offered to let him stay on her couch. Leslie was one of the residents who opened her door for the party. She helped Emmanuel dress up as a construction worker. Emmanuel was a stranger at the party. He didn't know anyone other than Leslie. He didn't talk too much, but he did interact with a few of the other partygoers. As the party continued, some people started getting a little rambunctious, alcohol-fueled arguments erupted. At one point, Emmanuel was accidentally struck in the lip, and Arpana was involved in an unrelated argument. Despite this, people thought that the party was going pretty well, which may say more about their standards than the actual state of the party. Emmanuel met Arpana during the evening. He visited her apartment earlier in the night and a second time around 1 a.m., Arpana invited a few people to her bedroom to show them something on her laptop. Emmanuel was in this group. He also used her bathroom at one point. Sometime around 2.30 to 3 a.m., now on November 1, 2008, Emmanuel left the party and returned to Leslie's apartment. According to Emmanuel, he watched television in the living room. He placed over 20 calls to three women between 1.54 a.m., and 4.48 a.m. One of those women was Leslie Potts. Not all the calls resulted in a conversation. For example, with some of them, there were voicemails that had sounds on them like someone shuffling. Emmanuel said that he went to sleep in the apartment and stayed there until 9 or 10 a.m. Arpana went to bed in her apartment as the party was wrapping up. This was sometime between 3 and 4 a.m. A neighbor was the last person to see her that night. The neighbor said that there was a tall man with olive skin standing in Arpana's doorway talking to her at 3 a.m. 
At about 8 a.m., Arpana's next-door neighbor heard a growling sound coming from her unit. He attributed the sound to one of two activities, sex or vomiting. After this, water could be heard running in the pipes between the walls. The water ran for an hour. Arpana's father noticed that she missed her daily call with her family in India and did not show up to work on Monday, November 3. He asked a friend to check on her. When the friend arrived at the Valley View Apartments, he ran into one of Arpana's neighbors. The friend and the neighbor knocked on Arpana's door, and it opened. The door had been broken. They found Arpana's naked body face down, partially covered by a green sheet. She was on the floor of her bedroom. They did not make contact with her body. Rather, they immediately ran outside and called 911. Here's what the police found during their investigation. The door lock and the door jam were broken. Arpana's body was bruised and her mouth was covered in tape. Some sources say it was duct tape. Others say it was electrical tape. The lower half of her body was covered in motor oil. There were burn marks on her body and in the apartment. It appears as though the perpetrator did not realize that motor oil is not technically flammable. Arpana's fingers had been cleaned and then covered in toilet bowl cleaner. There was an overwhelming smell of bleach in the apartment and stains from bleach on the carpet. A bottle of motor oil was found in a nearby dumpster along with Arpana's robe. The two items were in the same bag, which strongly suggested that this was the motor oil found on Arpana's body. The medical examiner determined that she was murdered sometime between 3.30 a.m. and 8 a.m. on November 1, 2008. She had been strangled with a bootlace. There may have been an assault of a sexual nature as well, but the police could not be sure. Arpana's phone and digital camera were missing from the apartment. The police started looking at people who attended the party, believing that one of them was probably the killer. They noticed from photographs taken at the party that Emmanuel was there. They searched his criminal history and found his conviction. The police were also suspicious of Emmanuel because it was difficult to get in contact with him. Leslie told the police that Emmanuel was having trouble with his cell phone. Not only was Emmanuel still on probation, but he never updated his address with his parole officer. Therefore, he had an outstanding warrant. The police took him into custody at gunpoint. Emmanuel was placed in jail for violating the terms of his probation as the police continued their investigation. Eventually, the crime lab identified Emmanuel's DNA on four different items potentially related to the crime. Toilet paper found in the apartment, the tape that was wrapped around Arpana's mouth, the front of Arpana's neck, and mixed with her blood on her robe, which was found in a nearby dumpster. Emmanuel was charged with first-degree murder on October 29, 2010, just about two years after the murder. He was not the only person being investigated by the police. The police found DNA from several other males as well. Some of them were never identified. Their prime suspect initially was a man named Cameron Johnson. He was the neighbor who entered the apartment with the family friend and found Arpana's body. It's worth noting that Cameron was never charged and denied any involvement in the crime. The police had a number of reasons to be suspicious about Cameron. His DNA was found on the bottle of motor oil, which was thrown in the dumpster near the crime scene. According to a lawsuit later filed by Emmanuel, Cameron's DNA was also on a wet area of the carpet in the apartment, and his fingerprint was found on the inside of a window in the apartment. Cameron had printed a list of pawn shops on the day Arpana was murdered. Again, her phone and camera were missing. This makes it seem like maybe he was trying to sell them. Some neighbors said that Cameron was romantically interested in Arpana. For example, he would get angry when she talked to other men at the party. On the day of the murder, Cameron drove to the Canadian border and tried to cross, but was turned back because he did not have a passport. He later spontaneously stopped at a party with friends and tried to wrestle them. Cameron had a limp as if he had been injured. His friends said that he had it when he arrived. The police thought that maybe Cameron initiated the wrestling activity so he could explain this injury. The police interviewed Cameron. He said that he was attracted to Arpana and tried to quote-unquote hook up with her that night, but it didn't happen. 
Cameron said that he went to his apartment sometime around midnight. He heard moaning from Arpana's apartment at 3 a.m. He was unable to explain why his DNA was on the bottle of motor oil. He did not recall ever printing out a list of pawn shops. He explained his trip to the Canadian border by saying he just wanted to go for a drive. Cameron told the police that he called Arpana at 10 a.m., but when the police examined his phone, they found that he had called her at two other times, once at 2.56 a.m. and again at 3.02 a.m. He told the police that he didn't remember why he called Arpana. Cameron remembered that he sent a text message at 2.59 a.m. to a former girlfriend. He was looking for sex. So Cameron remembered sending that text, but not calling Arpana three minutes before that text message and again three minutes after the text message. The police asked Cameron if he went to Arpana's apartment after calling her. He responded, I don't think so. For some reason, the police allowed Cameron to leave the police station with his BlackBerry. Later, he deleted everything on it. According to a lawsuit filed by Emmanuel, Cameron told friends, quote, what if I did this murder and I don't remember, unquote. The police thought that Cameron may have been involved in the murder. They suggested that perhaps he was in a conspiracy with Emmanuel. The two men had spent about a half hour together on the night of the Halloween party. Perhaps they decided during that time to commit the crime. This explains why DNA samples from both of the men were recovered in places that make them look guilty. The police decided to charge Emmanuel, but they never charged Cameron. Emmanuel Fair went to trial for murder in 2017. The prosecution argued that Emmanuel and Cameron had conspired with each other to commit the murder. The prosecution described Cameron as an uncharged accomplice and asserted that he may have been involved in some way. The state was arguing that the jury could believe that Cameron was involved or not, but that didn't change the state's assertion that Emmanuel was guilty. The jury could not reach a unanimous verdict and a mistrial was declared. Before the next trial started, the court determined that the state could not present Cameron as an accomplice if he wasn't going to be charged. Now the state was in a bad position because evidence pointing to Cameron's potential involvement also pointed to Emmanuel's innocence. Emmanuel was tried again in 2019 and was found not guilty. After the verdict, members of the jury made it clear that they did not believe Emmanuel was innocent Rather, they believed he was not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. They said that the evidence pointing to Cameron created that reasonable doubt. Emmanuel Fair filed a lawsuit against the government for prosecuting him. Now moving to my analysis. This case is complex because of the number of people who entered the victim's apartment not long before she was murdered. Male DNA was found at the scene, but not all of it was identified. In addition to the DNA from Emmanuel and Cameron, DNA from a man who was in a sexual relationship with Arpana was found on a sheet that was partially covering her body, and it was found on her costume. A different man's DNA was found on the bootlace used to strangle her. Both of those men were cleared of any involvement. Despite being found not guilty, the state of course believed that Emmanuel was guilty, which brings me to the question, was Emmanuel Fair guilty of murder? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that he was guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. Emmanuel had a criminal record for a crime related to sex. He did not have an alibi. His story about being in Leslie's apartment after the party didn't make sense because he used his phone to call her. Why would he need to call her if he was in her apartment? Emmanuel was physically capable of breaking the front door of Arpana's apartment and conducting the attack. His DNA was found in four places, including mixed with the victim's blood on her rope. Moving to the exculpatory factors, the police thought that Cameron Johnson may have been involved. His DNA was on the container of motor oil, and his behavior after the murder was bizarre. Emmanuel Fair's DNA, being found at the crime scene, can be explained by his attendance at the party. As far as the DNA found on the victim's neck and mixed with her blood on the robe, these were very small samples. Some of the DNA testing was new technology. Perhaps it was not accurate. 
Emmanuel did not leave the Valley View apartments for two days after the murder. One would think that if he was guilty, he would have left the area immediately. Emmanuel was the only black man at the party. Perhaps the police targeted him based on his race. The last person to see Arpana alive saw a man who was not black standing in her doorway. The police contacted a self-proclaimed psychic named Alison Dubois, who was the inspiration for the CBS TV show titled Medium. They were hoping that she could find the missing cell phone and digital camera and identify any other witnesses. I can just picture this interaction between the psychic and the police. The psychic would be conducting a reading of the police and say something like, I am receiving a message from the afterlife. It says that I'm sitting with investigators who don't have critical thinking skills. If she did say something like this, at least she would get one thing right. When considering the evidence, do I think that Emmanuel Fair was guilty? No, I do not believe he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The evidence against Cameron Johnson cannot be ignored, and the new DNA test that was used seems experimental and unproven. I'm not convinced that Emmanuel's DNA was actually on the victim's neck or mixed with her blood on the robe and the rest of it can be explained by the fact that he attended the party. Even still, Emmanuel had committed a horrible and violent crime earlier in his life and was clearly a dangerous offender. I think he was probably guilty in reality. This was a case where the state was trying to make lemonade out of lemons. The evidence against Cameron was a real problem for them, so they decided to say, well, maybe he was an accomplice. In reality, any evidence against Cameron worked strongly in Emmanuel's favor. It offered an alternate theory of the crime. The idea that Cameron would have been an accomplice did not make a lot of sense. Why would Emmanuel and Cameron have conspired after meeting for the first time that night? It appears as though one person committed this crime. The question is, who was that one person? It may have been Emmanuel, it may have been Cameron, or it could have been somebody else. I think whoever committed the murder specifically targeted Arpana. She was not selected at random. Now moving to my final thoughts. DNA testing is a phenomenal tool for law enforcement, but this case illustrates the danger of making inferences simply by finding DNA. If someone's DNA is found at a crime scene, that is evidence that they were there at some point, but it doesn't indicate when or what they were doing. In this case, there was no question that both Emmanuel and Cameron were in the victim's apartment for the party. This information was known without any DNA testing. Simply being in a location doesn't prove that somebody committed a murder, or any crime for that matter. Some of the DNA found in the apartment belonged to people who were definitely not at the party. Whether Emmanuel was guilty or not, it's possible that he was initially targeted by the police based on his race, but I think there's a better chance he was targeted based on his criminal record. Maybe both factors played a part. There are many reasons not to commit crimes. The permanent criminal record system is one of them. Once a person is convicted, they will be a suspect for the rest of their lives in every future crime that occurs near them. Those are my thoughts on the case of Arpana, Janaga, and Emmanuel Fair. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.